Hey, Marie, thanks so much for joining me. You're welcome. I'm excited to be here. So I figured one great place to start is level set a little bit on, you know, what is diplomacy and cultural affairs? I think a lot of people have misconceptions. They probably, I mean, maybe I'll ask you this way. Is it just fancy dinners and cocktails, Marie? Well, I wish it was. Uh, but actually, it's really, I think, just people of people engagement, where it's mm. the personal relationships that are so transformative, whether it's uh, people from other countries coming to the United States and experience it and, and the immersion of it, and, and individuals going to other countries. People like myself, who went to Poland and Hungary as a delegate for the American Council of Young Political Leaders, the way they put a delegation together for that group, for example, it was Republicans, Democrats, and Independents from different states, women and men, where we went to Poland and Hungary. We went to a large city, and we went to a small city in each of those two countries. And it was very transformative. And of course, the group actually really bonds together. You might have differing opinions as Americans, but at the end of the trip, you become lifelong friends after That's the two great. weeks. And we've also had reunions. And I was so excited about being part of this delegation that I actually served on the board so I could actually help nominate more uh, young leaders. But I, I just give that as an example because I personally know how impactful that was for me on my trip, and I, what happens when people come here, whether they're a high school student um, or a Fulbright scholar or students uh, or teachers or PhDs go outbound, it's, it's, it's just incredibly impactful. And lastly, I'll, I'll share people like Margaret Thatcher, who came as a young parliamentarian. She had not really traveled much. She came as part of the International Visitor Leadership Program, mm. and that program uh, celebrated 80 years in 2020. And I was able to unveil her picture. This is right before COVID hit, and as part of the 80 Faces of Exchange. And I quoted a letter, and she said after her trip uh, that she'll always be a friend of the United States. And so consequently to go to cities across the U.S., to meet people, to have lifelong relationships. It actually creates these channels. So even when we have times in the world like we have today, there are always people that know each other personally that they can always reach out to and have a conversation. And so that really is what people of people diplomacy is. And it actually was listed in the uh, national security uh, strategy for the United States about the power of those networks. Mm, I love that, the relationship equity. And, and what, one thing I love is, is um, I'm interested to hear your perspective going from the corporate world into government and diplomacy, because um, there's so many parallels. And, but I, um, I think the first thing that I loved about it, based off of our last conversation, is you found ways to really measure the results. I think in a lot of ways, yes. people would say, well, is this just warm and fuzzy stuff in relationships? You know, can we really measure it? Why would we invest in it? And I'd love to hear you know, how you took those, those, those concepts of measuring results into diplomacy. I always uh, measure throughout my whole career in business. I always remember what Tom Peters said, you get what you measure. Mm. When I went to the uh, US Department of State I used all my business skills and started with creating a uh, collective uh, set of goals, which we did as a, a whole bureau. We actually created goals around the national security strategy, the four pillars. And then the fifth goal we created was around measurement and impact. Mm. Uh, as far as um, I'm concerned, and I think we had a lot of support, measuring is one way you can really uh, understand whether a program is effective or not. And I can tell you this, here we are in this very important critical time, and one of the measurements that we had was how many young leaders that came as high school in the Future Leaders Exchange, as an example, have gone on to be uh, bigger leaders in their countries. 30% mm. of the Ukrainian parliament were part of the Future Leaders Exchange, where they come for 10 months, live with the host family, participate in school, part of yearbook, uh, clubs, uh, let's say even football team, and then they do approximately 300 hours of community service in the U.S. Wow. They live all around the U.S., and I had an opportunity to speak to them, 
as a collective group from all these countries from Eastern Europe and Central Asia. The program's been going on for close to 28 years now. Uh, and what I would just say is it makes me feel very good just knowing that these young people who went into leadership positions had an opportunity to learn about rule of law, democracy, freedom. And I believe a lot of those people are those that are there protecting their country today. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, that's an example of a measurement that we were able to uh, evaluate uh, as part of our, our program. That's impressive. That's a large percentage uh, of, of folks that made it over there. That's great. Um, I was wondering, because I also, I agree, I, I, I kind of feel that you can measure, almost measure anything. Do you think there's things that you can't measure? Or, or should you be able to measure just about anything? I think you can just measure about yeah. anything. Uh, most, most of my career was in uh, business where it was much more measurement oriented. Uh, for example, I worked in just about every business function, marketing and finance and research, and then I worked in research and development. And then I worked in uh, a government affairs role. And of course, uh, most of my experience was what we call line versus staff. And line is where you're bringing in the revenue. And then all of a sudden now you're in staff. And that was when I was working in public affairs, government affairs. So you have to show your value and what we did was we actually were able to take a, uh, a a board, a vision board, and measure just about everything, how many impressions we had. One of the things I remember clearly was a goal we had, which was to get connected to our member of Congress where our, our major locations were in the U.S. And we, always, we had basically a goal of one per quarter to come out to our location. And we were able to have five different members, so we overachieved in that goal. Uh, and that was really important because now those members of Congress really got an understanding in our world of what uh, telecommunications was. We had an opportunity to talk about software, the cloud, and see uh, these individuals in their own district. And so then you could actually talk to them uh, before a hearing and then they can act, ask very important questions to witnesses. And of course, that's all mm. measurable, as an example. Uh, but I would just say, be, instead of just saying, oh, we can't measure, uh, we, we actually uh, worked hard to say, how, how can we do that? And we, we also uh, talked about where, how we're performing against our goals every week. And, and that's one of the things I did at the uh, US Department of State. It's not enough to set up goals and measurements. You have to actually make sure that everybody continues to measure against it and report out. And it was exciting for me because we set up a meeting every month where people could talk about their projects and how they were uh, measuring and what the outcomes were against the goals. And that, that was, to me, very exciting. That's great. Yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm a firm believer that if you don't measure it, it doesn't get done. Um, but I know that it could be dangerous because even myself, what I've been guilty of is if you measure the wrong things and you, you let people know that you're measuring those things, then you get behavior that you don't want. You know, So a lot of the, the challenge seems to be making sure that you're measuring the right things. Otherwise, you just have 100 numbers in front of you, right? That reminds me of when I first started my career. It was all about total quality uh, management and quadrant two, which was right things right. I don't know if, mm. if you were taught that, but it was uh, you know, going back to what were the important things to measure uh, and you want to be right about those instead of just some uh, measuring things that were, weren't very important. And I, I think, you know, you're going back to like what types of things that I bring over, I always in my entire career followed the Pareto principle mm -hmm. with the 80-20 rule. And it takes a little bit of work to decide uh, which, which items are the priority, but it works every time. And every a distribution of 100 there are always 20 out of the 100 that will yield the 80% of the results. Mm -hmm. So you have to say to yourself, well, what are you trying to achieve? Uh, which, um, in essence, accounts, countries, programs are going to yield the most results? And it doesn't mean that you don't uh, do anything for the others, but it's just really important. And even when I taught at the university, I would tell the students the same thing. I mean, you could spend all your time on something that's worth 10%. Or, or really size up what the teacher is looking for and say, well, if I do these two things and it's going to be 90% of the grade, I really should put my time and effort on those. And that's really 
how we did things at the U.S. Department of State in the Bureau. Nothing more frustrating than spending your time on the wrong 10 or 20 percent. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then there's the other aspect, which is you can measure it, but but you know, how do you know if you're doing a good job? Is that measurement good? Is it bad? Are we sandbagging ourselves? And last time we spoke, we talked a bit about baselining, and and I'd love to hear you know your experience, you know how you've leveraged baselining and and how that's worked for you. Well, I really like that question because my whole career I learned how to benchmark. Mm. And it's been very important throughout my entire career. What that means is that you have to look at the best of class of, of who does what best and anything you're trying to measure. For example, my early career at the time uh, for uh, retail uh, mail order sales, it was L.L. Bean had the best fill rate. Mm. So if you're going to create a direct mail program, uh, basically for uh, package goods, retail, or let's say credit cards, that was American Express for collections, you have to look at uh, how to benchmark. So one of the things I did when I went into the uh, government affairs job, I was trying to get advocacy for the United States government. So I went around to all these uh, government officials and I said, what company does the best job at advocating? And I won't share with you what company, but it was uh, unanimous. And then I, what I learned from that was that there was an advocacy center at the U.S. Department of Commerce and that the United States could advocate for you if you uh, filled out an application. And then you could have the U.S. Uh, government officials advocate on a, on a deal to another country. So I used the advocacy process when I was part of a bid. Uh, Lucent was the prime at the time with MCI as a sub for a, it was called the fiber optic ring in Afghanistan. Mm. Uh, and the reason I say that was uh, I learned a lot because I ended up meeting with that company, learned how they do things, and then I emulated it and, and drew a model. Uh, and then the other thing I did from a, another example was another company was winning all these grants. So I asked them, again, you're not sharing anything proprietary, uh, how they did it. And I actually drew a model, and we decided to hire a grant writer and emulate what they had done. Uh, so it really helped us. And so so now you go into the U.S. Department of State. I went in, before I went into the position and I before my hearing, I had relationships with the previous assistant secretaries who all publicly endorsed me. I also met with them to learn how uh, they approached the Bureau and how they looked at problems and, and any advice that they could provide. I found that to be incredibly valuable. I hmm. uh, met with my predecessor and... Uh, and uh, for about four hours, and then I met with another one of the former assistant secretaries for about five hours. So even when I went to go teach at the university, I never had taught before, but I had been on five university boards. So one uh, a faculty member went on a uh, sabbatical for two years. I took that person's classes, and what happened was I ended up trying to decide how to teach them. Mm. So I went to three different classes, of different faculty members that taught that class. Once I saw how they did it, I decided what my way of doing things would be, and I created kind of a hybrid of that. And then from that, I uh, really learned how kind of what my own teaching style was. And of course, I actually started uh, getting uh, having lessons as a faculty member. I was teaching full time, and I would sit in on other classes. So I and and I had a mentor that really helped me. He actually had been on Broadway as a child actor. He was an outstanding professor. But he talked me about how to kind of walk the room and get the students engaged. And so I would just say that this was audio, visual, and sensory. Mm. But we were really trying to get the students involved. I did a lot of field trips. Uh, but going back to how did I do it, and even you know going back to State Department or teaching at a university or working in major companies, I would always try to meet with people. I also ask for mentors. That's one of the things I would let you know, that I um, actively sought mentors, asked for them, and uh, was fortunate enough to have some, but oftentimes I had to seek them out, uh, and people that I would go and meet with to get advice. Mm -hmm. So I think I would just say that you cannot sit there waiting. You have to be proactive. Yeah, and learning from the best, learning from your predecessors, it's, you know, there's a wealth of knowledge to be absorbed. And I, my experience has been, 
if you look f to the if you talk to the the people who are the best at something, they're usually very happy to tell you because guess what? There's really no secrets in there. It's usually a lot of hard work, and they know that it's going to take you a lot of hard work to get there. You know, I, I always. I remember back when Apple was 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 um, first getting huge success with design, and um, you know, I'd talk to clients, and they'd say, "We want our experience to be just like Apple." I'm like, "Go look at how much they've invested in get, making their experience how wonderful it is, and you'll realize that you're not you don't have the you probably don't have the willingness to invest as much as they have in there." So I, I find that that benchmarking and not just tells you you know where the right target is, but it, it helps you justify how much you should invest in something um, and get your arms around that. Yeah. Well, I will also add that when I was in the telecommunications world, uh, I was responsible for the political action committee, and we didn't have a very big one. And there were two major telecommunications operators that had the largest uh, PAC um, groups. And so what I did was I actually decided to have the interns who are very smart, give them the assignment to go out and meet with the PAC managers. So we created questions of how they did it. Mm. And so consequently, uh, the two companies were AT&T and Verizon, who are our major operators that bought from our, us as an infrastructure provider. And it was really terrific because we learned actually how to create a whole program for our own company and we ended up having the president of the United States, excuse me, not of the United States, but for our company in the U.S., uh, be in charge of our PAC program. And we, we also create a lot of visibility for those people that decided to support it. That's fantastic. And in, in looking at some of the programs that, that you accomplished um, at the Department of State, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit about um, how do you bring together all these multiple cultures? Because even if you look at any global corporation, they all have their micro cultures, you know, based off of location, and what functional group they are in the yeah. business. And you, you want to get people together, but you also want them to maintain their own voice and their own agency while collaborating and building relationships. So I'm curious what your approach has been there. Well, one of the things I did was I tried to think of ways to bring people together. Mm. And I'm, I'm a big fan of, of um, learning and knowledge. So I detri decided to create a policy series. And people could choose to be part of it where they could come in person. And then they also could listen in. And what I, it also brought me back to my business days. And I really replicated it where we brought in top officials inside the State Department to be speakers each month. And so why was that important? Well, if you have num uh, very uh, senior officials inside of the State Department now speaking one at a time each month about their bureaus or their uh, subjects, they have a much more ownership in what you're doing because they, one, they have to prepare, two, we, we uh, go over with them about how we're already engaging. And oftentimes there were meetings afterwards where the uh, individuals from their teams actually met with our people and how we could do more collaboration. Mm -hmm. And the, the other benefit was that we actually had kind of resources that were created that we could reference. And then we also created an orientation program to help uh, new employees in our bureau actually learn all about the rest of the U.S. Department of State and also be much more knowledgeable on a lot of policy topics. Uh, and these were, of course, uh, you know, the topics were presented by these experts, like um, ambassadors, and undersecretaries, et cetera. And one topic I remember was uh, very important to me was um, on religious freedom and also mm -hmm. uh, the Uyghurs. And so I thought it was important for us to understand it. Uh, so we, that was just an example. But every month we had a different uh, topic. And, and that brought people together. That's great. Yeah, really empowering them to, to, to have ownership in the process. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so you oversaw a, a tremendous amount of programs. I'm curious out of them, w which ones are the, you the most proud of? Well, I had a, a staff, a team of approximately 700 individuals and a budget of approximately $760 million. And I had a global responsibility. One of the programs I was very um, happy and proud of was I was asked to try to help create a program in very quick timing to empower women around the world and bring them into the global workforce. That was around a White House initiative. 
And so uh, we went right out to uh, Thunderbird Global School of Management at Arizona State. And there was a program called Dream Builder, which was created by Freeport McMoran. And this was to help entrepreneurs learn business. Hmm. It was developed in Spanish and it was developed in English. It was about 13 weeks. And what we, what we found was a lot of people have businesses, but they don't have any business training. Hmm. So that's really important. You know, how do you create a business plan? How do you do marketing? How do you get uh, investors, for example? And so consequently, uh, I signed an MOU with uh, Arizona State's Michael Crow and the CEO of Free Park MacBrin, and we created a program. Now, here's where we created a program because this is an online course. We had embassies uh, launch these and have cohorts of, of women, and it was very diverse. So it could be young women or old women, older women that wanted to develop business skills, and then we, they were trained and they were given mentors. And who were these mentors? Many of people were part of this alumni network. We had 350,000 people a year in exchange programs and millions of alumni that could help mentor these women. So for example, I went out to Columbia and launched this program there. And I'll just tell you that we started with 26 countries. And when I left, it was 80 countries. Wow. And I brought in a major corporation as, as uh, partners like uh, UPS and Amazon and MasterCard to try to help even leverage the money even further. But I, when I went to Columbia to launch this program, we had a woman that came up on stage with tears in her eyes. She, had, she was a woman that created uniforms. And so from this program, she was able to now create from two jobs, six jobs, mm. which is very important because a lot of these women never had the skills or the knowledge and the tools and the mentors. So that to me was an incredibly uh, powerful program. Uh, and there's a number of different alumni today that have been um, you know, developing their businesses and, and actually hiring more employees. And I'm uh, very happy. And what did we call that program? We, we created it and it was, we called it Academy, of, excuse me, Academy of Women Entrepreneurs which is awe. Uh -huh. And in Africa, when I launched it in Ghana, they called it Awe. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, but I would just, you know, I was so proud of it. And um, I, there are women every week that are still talking about this program. And I still get people in my network that uh, contact me about the successes that they're having uh, with their businesses. That's so great. Yeah, I mean, Speaking from experience, I, I feel that entrepreneurs' typical business training is just a series of very expensive <laughs> mistakes along the way. That's what my experience has been a bit. Um, I, you know, I'm curious then, um, what were the big things that you found that were the same versus were the different between your corporate life and, and your government life? Well, one of the uh, college students asked me a question I still remember. She was part of this program called the Critical Language Scholar. The critical language scholars was 15 different critical languages and they would go outbound as college students. And I think some were uh, seniors in high school. And she said, Assistant Secretary Royce, you were a businesswoman and now you're a government official. Tell us how you uh, work with the Bureau and what's the same. And I said, you know, and I did it spontaneously, but I said, every single day in business, I woke up and I thought about the stockholder. I said every single mm -hmm. day in the, in the U.S. Department of State, I wake up and I think about the taxpayer. Because what I do every day is I think, how can I do things that are going to impact uh, the taxpayer because they're giving us money just like the stockholder in a company? Because I always thought to myself, let's think about that woman or man, their whole life is invested in your, in your company. And here they are at the stockholder meeting with the gray hair. They're giving you their money as an investment. And that's really the way I see it as, as the taxpayer. So one of the things I did with the Foreign Policy Journal, I actually did something and I was asked to do it and I was so happy to write it, which was how exchanges pay off for Americans. So sometimes people say, well, how does this benefit me? And so my goal was to make the case of why. And one of the uh, examples I used was the Why, why Light program. It was young leaders from Latin America. 
and they were actually partnered with um, businesses in the United States. So I had incredible numbers, going back to measuring, of, of uh, entrepreneurs who were doing supply chain uh, trade to businesses here in the US. For example, a company in Charlotte was now selling to a, a company in Latin America, and they never would have done that uh, if they hadn't been a part of this exchange program. So the great benefit was mm -hmm. there was more money coming into the community in the United States, as an example, and more international sales. So that's an example of where it would pay off for an American. Or just even the fact that these individuals come to your community so every person can have an international experience. You could live, be part of a, your community and be uh, engaged through global ties. Global ties is 40,000 people in the US plus are part of this and they decide, well, I'm, I'm in my city and I wanna meet international uh, exchange participants when they come to town. Uh, I, I did a video, just so you, uh, I'd be happy to share it, with Ambassador Daniel Mulhall. He's he, mm, a little he's bit good. over 45 years ago. He's the ambassador of Ireland. He came from Waterford, Ireland at age 19 to St. Louis, Missouri. Sorry, Kansas City. I'm sorry. Kansas City, Missouri, as a summer work travel exchange participant. And he said it was so transformative that it changed his life. He was mentored by businessmen. I think they were Irish American businessmen. They took him to restaurants and ball games, but he had never uh, met anyone from an international perspective. And he carried that through his life. And now he's the sitting ambassador for Ireland here in the United States. So again, he made he went back and captured all this. We actually had a film crew go out when he uh, when he told me he was going out to kind of retrace his steps. I I asked our team to go out and. Um, follow him. We also got on, on the nightly news. But it's a good example of, of why that was so powerful. And not only did he get impacted, but he also impacted the community that he was in as an as a Irish young man. And sometimes people never had the experience of meeting anyone internationally. Uh, so here, mm. here they get to go to all these communities and uh, it's just really powerful. Yeah, some of us can forget that, you know, the, the some of us that maybe travel more forget that we might that we're very lucky to do so and that there's a tremendous amount of people who you know they it's kind of 30 30 minutes there you know 30 miles around their hometown they don't go too much farther than that i found it interesting though about the way you explain the differences uh, or commonalities between government and um and commercial um because it does come back to that measurement it was how you measure yourself who you who are you accountable mm -hmm. to Right, and um, so I, I think that that's really inspiring. Always remembering who it is. Every day that you wake up, who are you accountable today, uh, wherever you happen to be? Um, so Marie, I, I always like to finish uh, on a, a fun note. Um, you know, given the great mentors that you've had throughout your whole life and career, what's the best advice that you've ever received? Well, that's a, a tough question here. I've had a lot of advice. Uh, well, I do have one I can give you uh, because I actually mm -hmm. had a chance to do this at the State Department. When I was there, I never did anything personally where I, I kind of did a training. And, and when COVID hit, I thought, you know, I'd really like to do something for the Bureau. And actually, and I opened it up to all of public diplomacy, which was uh, larger than my Bureau. Uh, and it was basically the advice that I was given uh, by my mentor. I was told by my mentor that I had to teach, uh, basically treat everything like I was the conductor of an orchestra. Hmm. And every person is like a person in the orchestra that they all know their part, whether it's the violinist, the cello player, the flutist, or uh, the pianist, but they're waiting for you to bring them all together and to, and to play the piece the way the composer has created it, bringing everybody together. and it, each individual is so important. So what I did was I took a top, uh, I asked a top con uh, conductor here in Washington to do a uh, training with me. And we actually showed uh, very, uh, about six famous conductors in rehearsal and how, they, and how each person uh, prepared for that, no, full well knowing that each individual can um, play these parts, but 
the way the conductor leads them is in, is critically important. So what mm. what that really demonstrates, and I think it's incredibly important, is that as a leader, you have to make sure that every single person contributes, and that every single um, and then making sure you're bringing them in at the right time and that you also are including them because the piece will never be complete if it's not done that way. Mm, that's fantastic. I feel like I need to have a conductor on the podcast now. <laughs> well, <laughs> if you want a conductor, I've got one. Uh, yeah, and he, like, he's fantastic. I mean, yeah. and, and it's also interesting to tie it back to your, your earlier points. Um, you know, was something I know we do internally. We, we try to make sure that every single person on the team has at least one thing that's measurable for them, so that they can see how they're performing against it. And and maybe that that gets to that point of the conductor is every single person needs to be contributing, and and um, makes a lot of sense. I know it's funny because you're thinking, you know, let's say a person was doing a triangle or a, a sand block or whatever it could be. Uh, imagine taking that that instrument out of the piece it's it's not what was the composer had planned that's not the piece mm -hmm. it's not complete and so yeah, sometimes it, people think that somebody's not that important but every person is important it's interesting you said it's not complete it's not even a matter of is it better or worse it's just not what it was meant to be at that point even with the smallest thing not there i, I agree 100 percent and what was so interesting about the presentation is the uh, conductor said, look how excited everyone is. And it was so interesting to watch because you saw all these, uh, these musicians who are just exceptional, anxiously awaiting for the conductor to come into the room. And they mm -hmm. were, in other words, they knew their, they knew their instrument but they were looking to that conductor to lead them. That's great. And, and it's so great when you think about it because uh, they could actually do, the, do it all by themselves, but, but the bottom line is that the conductor is bringing them all together. And it's, it's exciting because the conductor has to help them come to the, the composer's vision. I love it. The same way that diplomacy helps bring people together and build those relationships. Marie, this was truly enjoyable. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. And it was really fun. And um, again, uh, people, to, people diplomacy is just incredibly important. Sure is. Thanks, Marie. Take care. Thank you.